is this movie that you're selling me or this documentary that you're selling me is it of any interest to anyone else okay. this is not about your life your, and your thoughts what's in and, your head yeah. you know and the 10 people that would look at this that, can i take it to a new metro and and sell it can i take it to um, a market in in europe and sell it so i need to to, to see is is it worth being marketed because you need to to make sure you've got a marketing plan you need to make sure you've got a distribution plan hey everybody sanbonani dumelang welcome to the epozi show my name is tabo Molloy, and this is a show where we sit down with real industry trailblazers to give you some thoughts wisdom and insights to help take your career and your business to the next level now you should know by now that we sit down with really phenomenal people and today ladies and gentlemen is no exception i am so excited with today's guest she's just an all-round marketing superstar she's got a bcom in marketing management qualification and she's got a public relations diploma and her career is full with a lot of depth and pedigree and brand and marketing management having worked for industry global market leaders like unilever and nestle and today she is a marketing manager for the durban film office and we are actually shooting live at Sun City. I mean, won't be live when you see this, but we are actually at Sun City because she is also one of the judges on the panel of the South African Film Television Awards, the 13th Saftas. So super, super excited to hear from Sharon Gumete. Yes. Sharon, welcome to the show. <laughs> oh, it's very nice to be here. Yeah. I'm glad it's my turn. Yes. I'm excited, very excited. Really? Mm. No, have you have you watched a few of the episodes I already? I have watched um, almost all of them. Really? Yeah, no, no, I know. No, that's I, that's that's really cool. I mean, I catch up. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's good. To, it's good to have you here. And you know, you know, on 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 the show, we have people who, who I believe are trailblazers, mm. and and you're a trailblazer as as well. So for me, it's an incredible honor to to know someone like yourself. Um, because you're not just, you know, marketing and management and, and corporate, but you also have like some entrepreneurial spirit within you. You know, you founded a, a sound company and a DJing academy, and you're also a DJ as well. But I'm curious to hear from you in terms of, you know, where does this all begin? You know, how do you wake up one day as a little kid and decide, you know, I'm gonna apply for marketing, you know, then you get the degree, then you go and build this career and you just grow from strength to strength. Like, where does that all come from? Yeah, okay, cool. So, it's it's been a journey. Um, you know, I was born in April and I, I do believe in stars and my star specifically says that I have a fiery personality, um, I get bored very easily and, and all of that. So, it, it, I fit in exactly into that category. Um, I mean, would you ever believe that after high school I actually studied civil engineering? Really? Mm. <laughs> well, that's, that was your first choice. <laughs> that straight from high school, wow. first choice was um, civil, uh, engineering. civil engineering. Why? Why would you want to do civil engineering? That's so I, different I from loved, what you're doing now. I loved buildings. I loved road maintenance, the construction of of bridges, um, structures, and built environment. Okay. I loved that. Um, it only tied up now how I ended up in civil engineering anyway. I've okay. just got such a love for, for, for structures and beautiful designs and whatnot. So, but I didn't really have to go and study it. Okay. <laughs> so what happened is I studied civil engineering at uh, DUT for about a semester and a half. I got into a car accident, broke my pelvis, couple of ribs, and I was stuck in a wheelchair for about half a year. Sure. And I just couldn't envision myself. I was in road construction at the time, and you walk for hours on end on the road, um, you know, measuring, and there was a whole lot of things that needed you to be actively on site. And so I couldn't, because I was in a wheelchair, I couldn't see myself doing it. So I started pulling back a bit there. As soon as I could walk again, um, I was feeling very low. Um, I needed a self esteem booster. And I actually entered a pageant in Durban uh, when pageants were still mm. the thing. 
and it was Mr. Teguini Municipality, funny enough, okay. uh, which I now work for, but no, no connection. Sure. It is on my CV. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely needs to be there. I'll put it there. I'll post that. It's but it, it was just a lovely thing to do because I wasn't one for beauty pageants. I was a tomboy. Um, I, I, I couldn't understand heels and nails and makeup. And so I thought, this is it. Let me do this. Um, and so what happened is... Um, I entered the pageant and I won it. Wow. And that one year, I think they were celebrating like a 10 year anniversary and there was a car up for grabs. So I was one of the first Mr. Tewinis to actually win a car. And it was time to collect my car and the organizers pulled back and said, oh, this was just a PR thing. Oh. There's no car. But um, it got so much media attention. I was on interviews on Metro FM and whatnot. What happened? Uh, you know, and became a topic. Mm. Um, as to these girls that enter pageants on, under false impressions and whatnot and whatnot and so it became a huge thing and then mm -hmm. that's how now I ended up in, a bit in media because yeah. I was hanging out to journalists, PR people, we want to do this with you, you know, and yeah, so I started looking at media and entertainment going, this is actually fun, you guys do fun work, you know. Mm -hmm. And I thought, you know what, let me, let me study this. And I, and I went and I registered for a national diploma in public relations uh, through UNISA. Did my in-service training at an event called Satma Awards, South African Traditional Music Awards. Um, and I really loved it. I, I really loved it. Um, and I love, I love taking opportunities. Um, I think when I was in high school, I'd see, we used to have a newspaper called Free For All. Yes, I you remember know, that, yeah. Yeah, I know. It what had is, competitions and competitions and competitions. <laughs> yeah. And so I would fill out and, and do as requested, email, drop it off there and whatnot. So I'd always be that girl called over the intercom to say, Sharon, there's a hamper for you. I'll get there and free for all standing with a big beacon hamper. Sure. And I won, you know, yeah. and I thought, oh, this is cool. So I'd take any opportunity that came my way. So I was watching TV one day while studying PR and um, it was Jam Alley. I was watching mm. Jam Alley, you know, the Friday night show. You knew yeah. you had to be home by six to watch your Jam Alley. And they were doing a competition um, called Jam Alley Girlfriends. And they did a call out, you know, if you've got a jam, if you've got a girlfriend that is good in a skill of sorts and you'd like her to be mentored, give us a shout and, you know, we'll, she might stand a chance to be one of the 10 that are selected to be here. So of course I forced one of my friends to yeah. nominate me. <laughs> <laughs> That's what friends are for. Yeah, no. <laughs> Write this letter. 100%. Won't you please just sign it? I've, I've actually written it for you. Yeah. And I sent it through and the Jam Alley producers called me and they said, we actually like this. Uh, your friend says you're an aspiring DJ. Um, yeah, no, actually uh, I, I do love sound. I do love DJing, but um, I mean, I'm stuck in Durban and there's not really a DJ school to help me with that. They said, okay, cool, you've made it uh, to the top 10. Went through, started training at Soul Candy. Um, DJ Terence was one of my mentors. DJ Mbuso was one of my mentors. Um, Euphonic would come in once in a while, but he wasn't formally my mentor. Um, he was also just starting out. Um, I started attending the South African Music Conference, which happens annually through e, um, it's uh, Euphonic and Oscar and Fresh. Okay. If you, sorry. And um, yeah, I started getting into now the business of music and DJing, but mm. I was really shy. Um, you know, standing on the decks and DJing and being out there, I could tell it wasn't really my thing. But I went ahead and learned uh, learned anyway how to DJ, mm. and so after that competition, I came second. I came back with a prize of about ninety k. Sure. Um, this was in two thousand and five, four or five. Mm. Um, I mean, ninety thousand rand was quite a That's lot. A lot of money. <laughs> and they said, you know what? Um, we want to do this next year. We want to follow you guys and see how far this ninety k goes. Um, what are you going to do with it? How are you going to build a business with it? How are you going to double it even or, or whatnot? And I said, oh, I'll show them actually. I'm going to triple this, if not more. So, I mean, I'd already won a pageant. I had a car, so I had the ease of moving around. And this was at age 20. Once so you eventually got the car after the whole Oh, drama. yeah, <laughs> no. I, um, my mother yeah. got the car for okay. me. <laughs> my mom was like, I know. <laughs> 
mother of the best. Yeah, no, she she, she, she got mother. her attorneys okay. uh, to assist me, and um, they were forced to actually buy me a car. Sure. And I had to now go to the shop and act yeah. like, oh, I want a car. So she was actually bought. You're high now. You've got yeah, the no. car. You've so got the money. I was able to move around, and now I had this 90K at my disposal, and I knew that Jam Ali would want to come back and check, what have you done with this money? Mm. And I thought, okay, um, well, let me buy a sound system and use it to hire. Um, at the time, girl DJs were just not really there. Yeah. Um, I think DJ Sindor was in the scene. DJ mm -hmm. Zinkler was still training. Um, and I thought, Ugh, I'm, I'm not one for the limelight. Let me just mm -hmm. buy a sound system. So I bought a sound system worth about 90,000 Rand. Um, and, I, and I carried on training myself to use it. So okay. anyone who'd call to hire it, I only put it on social media. Mm. Anyone who'd call to hire it, I'd give them a catch. Would you? Yeah, no, sure, I can take it, but only I can use it, you know. Mm. People would hire it, they'd bring it back. I mean, this is broken, this yeah. is what I'm not. So I thought, no, no, no. If you want my sound system, mm. I'm it, I'm your girl. And then it started picking up and brides would call and go, I want a female DJ playing, you know, I want, mm. I want a female DJ at my wedding. And it got really exciting. And um, I started hiring more people to help me. Um, you know, it would get awkward at events where I'd start connecting up the sound system and everyone would just be like, ah, don't be a DJ, you know, and I'm yeah. sure, you know, yeah, and, and then I'd go, right. come back and I'm, Full dress, fully dressed now, and it's time to DJ. Oh no, wait, she's actually she's the DJ. DJ. Yeah. Mm. So that's how I got into into hiring out of sound systems. Mm. Um, and then I thought, you know, obviously one has to grow, one has to share a skill, and uh, the guys that I was hiring to connect the sound systems to play, I wasn't always available. I thought, let me just open up a DJ academy. Sure. So I went to Joburg, um, there's um, a school called DJ Mix Club, okay. um, I spoke to them and they said, yeah, we are created um, schools that um, are interested in this type of business. One year license, um, renewable, do you want to go for it? Said, yeah, definitely. So bought more sound system when I got there and I opened the DJ school at the wheel um, in Durban mm. and they came in numbers. Um, wow. At first, I wanted it to be for female DJs, mm. but um, I, I, it was hard getting a hold yeah. of them. Everyone was scared, they didn't want to really. And then I just thought, okay, well, let's, let's just do everyone. Yeah. And is this something that just, I mean, that you feel like you were born with? Or is it something that just happened along the way? Because a lot of people who are entrepreneurial, mm will attribute it to like an upbringing you know yeah. i saw my mom and dad had a spaza shop yeah. or you know the auntie next door yeah. used to sell amakwenya but you know for other people who don't have that you know feel like they're not entrepreneurial because yeah. there's no upbringing for you was that the case or was it something that not stumbled on your lap um, across the, my across mother the journey? my mother was a teacher mm. my dad was also a teacher um no one in my business uh, business no one in uh, my family had a mm. business at all um, I think I'm just one to take advantage of opportunities um, I mean my mother was single the one thing I knew I wanted to do was never to trouble my mom for money or whatnot hence entering pageants yeah. you know I mean those consolation prizes were life Sure. I mean, I knew I wasn't hot, I knew I wasn't mm. the best shaped girl. I mean, I was scrawny in my jaws, hmm, you know. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. But the consolation prizes were life. Um, I remember one time I entered Miss City Press, um, also back in 2005, 2004, 5, 6, so like my, my year, like mm. let's go for it. So yeah. I entered Miss City Press, I mean, you had big brands giving us sunglasses, shoes for a year and whatnot. I didn't bother my mother for a long time after receiving those prizes. I sure. mean, they gave me camera, cameras and whatnot and whatnot. And it set me up for mm. good, so probably one year. Independent, be yeah, your own person, yeah. make so your own decisions. That was my drive. And then bought the sound system, hired it once. And I was like, oh, okay, this is good income. Mm. You know, and it was booked now for a wedding on Saturday and then somebody would call and say, well, I've got a funeral service, it's on a Sunday, can I? Oh, well, actually, yeah, well, it's just two speakers and this, let's do it. So the income's been good. Um, I've, I haven't gone into this to become rich, 
you know, I'd be driving my dream car right now if, if that was the, the need. Mm. I just take advantage of whatever is given to me and I make it work. Yeah. Um, inspire the next person in the hope that if it's their calling, mm. they can latch onto it and go yeah. with it. And that's so important because, you know, in the entertainment space, a lot of people lean onto the side of creativity. Mm. You know, feel like I'm creative and I'm passionate about creating. Yeah. But if you're gonna make a living out of it, yeah. you're gonna need to apply some business savvy. Yes, yes, you know, so it's, it's not enough true. that you, you know, got a great selection of music. Yeah. Or you know, you great in front of the camera. Yeah. But like what you were saying in terms of people that wanted to hire your equipment, you're like, ah, oh, but you're gonna have to use me because yeah. my equipment is expensive, and yeah. if something happens, you know what I mean. Yeah. And. That's what not a lot of people think about when it comes to the entertainment industry. Mm -hmm. There's a big focus around you know, creative passion, yeah. but the business savviness doesn't come through. Yeah. And you've had some corporate experience mm -hmm. um, in really reputable organizations. Yeah. Um, how does that play into these other passion points that you have, yeah. particularly in the entertainment space that you find yourself? Um, what kind of skills do you now leverage you know, working in film and being a DJ and running your own sort of entertainment business. Yeah, yeah so I've always just believed that um, you have to, from school, study and then move into a corporate. I think corporate is the first step that teaches you um, the formalities of, of, of running a business, mm -hmm. you know. Um, I remember when I went into Unilever, um, part of my interview was how would you treat a personal care category and I remember my answer was something along the lines of you need to treat each skew as its own business you know you can't have five skews in one range and the one is, is hardly selling and the one is a top seller mm. they need to to leverage you've mm. completely failed if one is so when you take that and you now apply it back into your own um, um, business uh, uh, um, skills yeah. it balances you out that okay I've got a sound system business that needs to make me money um, I can't give my sound business to someone else and then the sound comes back then now I need to now pay for repairs and this person's already paid a flat fee which now mm. doesn't account for that so it, it takes a lot I mean even being an artist being a DJ being any type of, of, of if you're in a creative industry and you you want to make a living out of it mm. you need to know the business behind it and you you need to have had some type of business training to maintain it Otherwise, you're just going to run around in circles yeah. like this. People are going to hire you and, and they're going to tell you, oh no, play for free, you're pushing your brand. Um, so and so will be there, might be an opportunity for you. It's not how it works. Yeah. I can't be playing at an event and you got paid 60,000 Rand and I was given 500 Rand petrol money. Sure. What does that say about mm. our talents? People don't know, they dance to all our songs, mm. but they don't know that somebody was you know, I'm in Durban, you have flown in from Joburg, already there's an investment on your part, mm. we get you, you get paid and I'm, I get given 500 rand, no accommodation for me because, so you need to be a businessman if you're going to run your own business in that yeah. sense, take yeah. care of your brand, build your brand and be a brand yourself. Mm. Um, somebody calls you to hire you, they can't give you the story of, oh, you're just pushing your brand, no. There's, there's a lot of ways of pushing a brand and playing for free at an event is not pushing a brand that's being used. No, 100%. And I love, I love the example you use um, from your interview, mm -hmm. you know, to say every single part is important, yeah. you know. And what that speaks to is this attention to detail. Yeah. It's sort of like a duality that you need to live in where you need to be very clear on the big picture mm. in terms of where you want to go but at the same time understand the detail yeah and how every part plays because to be quite honest you know a lot of people are naive you know and they think that um i'm talented and i've seen other people do this mm. and it looks easy enough yeah. you know for me to do it yeah but they're not taking the time to really research in depth each part mm. and, and, and the role that it plays and how it all then 
you know fit together yeah. you know because in your space I can imagine from you know the pageants and the confidence that it gave you mm. you know in terms of your self-awareness and to be able to put that across and then the media interaction that you had in radio from the car incidents and then having the confidence then to continue to enter competitions and each part you don't take it for granted yeah. you know my biggest struggle is my lack of patience sometimes mm -hmm. <laughs> you know because you've got this big picture view to say you know I'm, I'm gonna have this big production yeah. company I'm gonna do this but then you neglect the small, the small little SKUs yeah. Yeah. you know that actually balance everything yeah. out so you know that's that's a profound way I want to find out from you then you've got all these moving parts mm -hmm. in your life at the moment yeah. you know we're, we're here um, at, at the SAFTAs and, and you're, you're a judge on the panel um, but at the same time you know you've got this career mm -hmm. and you were DJ you know last night. last night at the beach party and you killed it <laughs> Thank you. you know and I mean there's only 24 hours in the day mm. so how do you make sure that you stay true to who you are, but at the same time, you're living. You're living your passions, you, you're building your business, and, and you, you these SKUs, no matter how small they are, you mm. keep everything in balance. How do you do that? Well, it, it, it's, it's not a conscious effort. I don't wake up in the morning and go, okay, today this is how it's gonna be. It, mm. I think I'm so used to it um, because it's, it's, it's a passion of mine. Yeah. Um, it's a skill, I mean, Nobody knows that I can play um, until you know. Yeah, last night. Nice. Like, oh wait, what? <laughs> sure, wow. <laughs> but um, you know, I I made a decision to become a mother eleven years ago, and I promised myself while still pregnant that you know what, this child, as much as he won't be the most spoiled or he won't have the best of everything, but I need him to make his own decisions. Um, I need him to take advantage of opportunities um if he sees a call out if you feel this is in your in, in, in your interest you know go for it and i wanted him to just really be a go-getter yeah. um i'll die one day and i think my biggest fear is what if he just crumbles and he just goes i wish mommy was here yes. i don't want him to wish that i want him to just go on with life. I mean, I was just telling you that he, he DJs better than me. I wow. I can leave him for a two hour set and he'll play gong and then he'll swap it over to, to, to hip hop mm -hmm. and he'll swap it over to old school Kwaito. And this wow. is an 11 year old child. He, I, I didn't even think he knew Kwaito, what Kwaito was, but he knows exactly, you know. And so I just wanted to be a role model to him. I didn't, want to be a role model to my neighbors and and mm. I just want to concentrate on knowing that my son will be okay in an event of my death he'll be able to make a decision he'll be able to 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 know that you know I don't need to go study actually now I need to follow my I, I need his passion to be backed up with some type of formal study okay. you know I'm not I'm not saying you know if you're a businessman you, you don't have a qualification it's, it means nothing no no I, I need him though to back it up yeah. um, there's certain skills and and that you feel I can make money out of it but without any business training or business knowledge then it becomes just a glorified hobby mm. um, yeah sure um, for me DJ is a hobby that's why it fits into everything my sound system is set up in my lounge um, you know I go to work every morning I'm a mm. marketing manager at a film office in, in Durban mm. We travel, um, go to other film festivals, you know, and it, it all just fits in. Yeah. Um, that is why DJing isn't, you'll never see me on a poster. Oh, Sharon, DJ, I don't, uh, DJ in my, my lounge. And mm. so my son is just like, oh, can, I, can I just play yeah. one, two? Now he just plays three say, three hour sets without even uh, stopping. Mm. And it's, it's now given him that skill. But um, I need him to know that you can't just be a DJ. Be a DJ with a business. Yeah. Even if it means opening up a production company, mm. managing other artists, managing DJs, mm. have a sound system, have a PR company, do something. If, if you're in that industry, 
branch out. Um, I'm actually against the type of businesses that do everything. Mm. You need to be a master of something, yeah. you know. And for me, marketing is is, is my core. Mm. That that is what I have studied. That's what I've done. But everything else is a DJing is a hobby for me. It keeps me happy. It relaxes me. It it so. When I walk in at home frustrated from a hard day at work, mm. I just switch on the sound system and I go put on my yeah. headphones and you, you know, and I just feel so bad for the neighbors because I, I, I <laughs> turn it up and I think that thing well, if, if they haven't now. complained, then no, I'm sure no, they, they enjoy haven't. it as well. Yeah. yeah. So it relaxes me. So I wake up the next morning when my son gets home, I'm already relaxed. You know, I cook and I'm I'm ready to. It balances me. Yeah, it that balances makes, me. It makes so, so much sense. Because um, I, I, I look at my life as well, and I'm discovering myself in different mm. spaces. And it's interesting because, you know, people are very fixed in their thinking, mm. you know, for lack of a better word, to, to, to define themselves and say, this is me, this is it. Yeah. And I read an interesting book lately, a memoir by Michelle Obama, mm. um, beautifully titled as Becoming. Yeah. You know, to say you're not you're not fixed in one space, yeah. but you're becoming evolving. And yeah. and in different spaces you're gonna manifest more of yourself. Mm. You you haven't completely discovered who you are, but you're gonna manifest more of yourself. Yeah. Not like in your life. I mean, who would have thought that a previous Miss Etewin, mm. you know, who would go on to win a DJing competition? Yeah. <laughs> work in corporate end up being a marketing manager in the yeah. Durban Film Office but that just speaks to a willingness to become and discover yourself yeah. in different spaces yeah. you know which I think is so important and so breathtaking when you meet people like yourself because other people watching can then find permission for themselves as well yeah. because I think a lot of the time we limit ourselves yeah and say you know this is it all right I am a singer I am a musician mm. I sing I don't know if you can sing or not, but you've but already you, defined yeah, yourself. Yeah, I'm a you know? singer. <laughs> but it's so important, especially in an entrepreneurial journey, to give yourself permission to find yourself. Mm. You know, because a lot of people, because of this like finite thinking, this mm. fixed thinking, then they don't they they rule out other spaces yeah. for themselves. Um, and what that speaks to me is is someone who has a willingness to learn. Mm. You know, what I hear from, from you when you speak of your son and, and wanting him to have this education, you just want him to have an ability to learn. Yeah. That's what an education does. Yeah. It just says, I empower you with the skills to acquire more skills, mm -hmm. you know? And now you're in an industry that's, you know, changing at a ridiculous yeah. space. You know, I mean, in 2014, when you stepped into the role there was no Showmax and yeah, SA and, yeah, and Netflix, Netflix and all these and things. So how do you adjust to that in your role? You know, as we're speaking about learning and acquiring skills, how do you do that to ensure not only can you keep abreast of what's happening, but you can also quickly learn the skills and hopefully take the business to the future where, to where the industry is headed? Yeah, yeah so we're constantly engaging uh, with the industry. Mm. Um, we travel a lot. Okay. We we go to you know where the the, the lead thinkers are, and we, we sit with them, and we go you know they they come to us. I mean Netflix was you'd be surprised to know, but a gentleman came to pitch it to us, mm. but we didn't think Netflix at the time. Really, we just thought this guy <laughs> just wants to waste data. He wants to waste. It's never gonna work. Yeah. But it's such a wrong way of thinking. But yeah, we engage with the industry. Um, it's constantly evolving, and you know, we, we travel. If if it's not available in South Africa, we go to whichever country. We attend that festival. We attend that market, and we just get more information. We bring it back, and you know, uh, uh, bring it back and share it with our peers as well. Um, it's the only way of keeping abreast. Also, just staying on the internet, seeing what's new. You know, mm. how it's done and whatnot. So yeah. And that's that's critical because you know you can't you can't say i want to be a musician or a dj or make film you can't say i want yeah. to be a film maker um and then you know buy a camera and then you start shooting in your neighborhood and you fool around in your computer 
without checking what's happening. Yeah. You know, what are other filmmakers doing yeah. out there? You know, and then being able to learn, S- sense check where you are. Mm-hmm. Say, okay, cool. I've got these skill gaps. That means I need to start here and learn and grow. Mm. Um, but this immersion into other cultures and other spaces to really draw those insights so that you can learn yeah. is so critically important, you know. And in your space and in, in traveling to all these um, film festivals and traveling abroad to these various awards, what are some of the things that other people are getting right out there? Mm. You know, whether it's their businesses in terms of the business of film and, and, and how you know artists are able to make proper living because in South Africa it's a space that I feel is usually largely under tapped yeah true there's a lot of potential but like it's not as big as it could yeah. be so what how what can we do like what have you seen other people in other industries when it comes to media entertainment and art um, what do they do to really like build big business out of it what are the learnings that you can share yeah Okay, to so answer the first kind of, you know, ask like six questions. Yeah, yeah, question. sorry, I do that. I like, like bring it all together. Yeah. But essentially, um, I think a, a good case scenario mm. for um, what you've just asked is the Fergusons. Okay. Um, am I allowed to mention? Yeah, you can mention <laughs> the Fergusons, yeah. I Name like job. what they've done okay. because, you know, uh, we call it Karabo. Yeah. Uh, from generations, <laughs> yeah. but um, I like what they've done because they saw TV almost 10 years down the line mm. and they prepared themselves for that and they geared themselves up for that and they brought 10 years to mm. now, to, to now. the now. Mm. Um, they started off with shows like The Wild and those shows were shot in 4D if I'm, I'm, I'm calling it correctly. And at the time, um, SABC and Mzanti Magic were not using that, that format, that you know, yeah. that technology. And so they didn't care. You know, they bought equipment to shoot in that high res because yeah. they knew that mm. this is where TV is going. Um, it's almost like they knew Showmax was coming, they knew Netflix was coming, and big, big business, you know, and, and they went for it. Um, so you pretty much need to be 10 steps ahead when it comes to the film industry. Um, especially for a woman, um, I've dealt with a lot of people who feel that women are not getting as much opportunities in film as men. Mm-hmm. But I just believe the same, but for South Africans. I don't believe that South African filmmakers are getting the same as other international. I think we, 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 we glorify too much of uh, yeah they might come up with this and that and that and then we we follow suit but like i said i met with a guy who showed me a concept and now i sit there and go oh my gosh it's netflix he he had he had something there yeah so yeah you need to constantly just keep at it and um and constantly just upskill themselves yeah um we as go- i work for a government uh, uh um, institution yes. and so we've got a lot of red tape um, we, we give funds to filmmakers to make films okay but the fact that funds are so limited we give about 250k for oh. a project wow. essentially it is to push you to do as much as you can with the little budget that you have mm. but because technology is just moving so fast we need to review that 250k to say you know what um, you know people want to shoot in in, in high res in 4d and we're still giving you a budget to shoot in 2d you know and, and whatnot. it's not really the best quality um, the likes of Mzansi magic there was no Mzansi magic a couple of years ago there was Africa magic mm. which you know when, when DSTV came hard in LSMC um, they introduced, if I'm certain, just watch Africa Magic. We mm. could hardly hear them. The sound was horrible. horrible it was yeah. terrible, terrible, <laughs> terrible. Yeah. And the movies were like four hours long. Very long. Like one scene can take 30 minutes. Yeah, no. This, this, like this you'd watch a person. A in a movie. Wa- <laughs> you'd watch a person walking from one house to another. Yeah. And they're thinking. And it was just too much. Mm. 
and I think the, the, the makers of Zanzi Magic sat and said, you know what, let's move 10 years down the line. Mm -hmm. Same format, four hour movies, raw LSMC stuff, you know, day to day, mm -hmm. dramas, um, but let's make it an hour, let's make it a 45 minutes, let's call it a feature, um, it's shorter, um, let's promote, uh, let's improve the sound, mm -hmm. let's do this, let's do that. and. Voila, you know, yeah. there was Ikasi, sto Ikasi Stories, mm. there was Musanti Magic, mm. and the birth of, of all now these telenovelas. Mm. Um, I mean, when the likes of Uzalo came onto TV, it, I don't even think it was, they knew they were a telenovela. They, I think they mm. called themselves a soapy, and then when they realized, no, we shoot in a different format to a soapy, mm. then it was classified a telenovela. I'm not sure, but that is just how much TV is evolving and you know we need to keep up and we as the, the fun funding institutions need to to review how we, we meet them halfway mm. you know but I mean I can imagine that the filmmakers themselves mm. there's certain criteria that they have to meet yeah. you know so for them to be fundable yes. they have to a meet. whole lot of criteria yeah but like what are the, some of the things that immediately stick out to you when you when someone comes to pitch an idea and yeah. you, what are the, some of the things that you'd be like okay this 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 is something yeah. that we can get behind okay so it would be the ease of how do i call it like is this movie that you're selling me or this documentary that you're selling me is it of any interest to anyone else okay. this is not about your life your, and your thoughts what's in and your head yeah. you know and the 10 people that would look at this that can i take it to a new metro and and sell it can i take it to um, a market in in europe and sell it so i need to to, to see is is it worth being marketed because you need to to make sure you've got a marketing plan you need to make sure you've got a distribution plan mm -hmm. so most filmmakers are just filmmakers they create a film they create a documentary and then they That's hand it. over Ish. to the next person mm. to do there and then it messes up completely messes up there mm. i mean even a script you, you draw up a script you give it to someone else and they completely butcher it mm. it comes back to you and you're like oh wait no that's not actually mm. what i wanted to to do so yeah um it's, it's, it's just having that you you need to for marketing, you yeah. need to try and meet your you need to know that filmmaking is a business mm. essentially that that's what it is um yeah it's good you've got a skill for making you don't need qualifications you don't need to be a filmmaker yes there's a um qualifications you can get in video technology if you want to be behind the scenes mm. in, in acting if you want to be in drama if you want to be an actress and whatnot but those qualifications as well do do train you to be a businessman but when as soon as you leave school they forget about all of that and mm -hmm. i just want to act sure and then i need to get a manager mm -hmm. you know in in all true sense no one ever needs a manager um <laughs> so i like i like what you mentioned there um in terms of you know filmmakers needing to be prepared and and, and think beyond just the film itself yeah but i also understand is this going to have an audience? Yeah. And and if it is going to have what I was looking for. And if it is <laughs> going to have an audience, um, how can I can, how can I get my content to reach it? How yes. how am I going to get distributed to I the right money audience? Money out of it. Hundred percent. Well. And I love the fact that you spoke about people not necessarily needing managers mm. because you need to know yourself yeah. and know your personal brand and not need someone else to sort of define that for you. Yeah. Because if you're going to need someone to define that for you, then you're at the mercy of that person. Yeah. You know, so it's very important for people to know who they are, know their personal brand, and know the business of their craft, mm -hmm. you know. But, you know, when I was listening to you talk about the Africa magic, mm -hmm. you know, because uh, my mom used to watch that and it used to drive me nuts because <laughs> it lasts for hours, you know, yeah. and I hate no it. Supper. <laughs> you know? supper. But what I appreciate though is that Nollywood didn't wait. No. They didn't wait for like, mm. you know, these high res cameras mm -hmm. and sound and this. They put together whatever they could put together and they moved. Yeah. And we, we were sitting in South Africa watching these movies yeah. from Nigeria, you know. What that speaks to me is just this bias for action. Mm. 
that people need to have because on the other extent, yes, quality is important. Yeah. But you need to get some momentum mm. so that we can see, okay, ah, there's potential here. Yeah. This person yeah. is going somewhere. And then that's how you learn, pivot, and, and, and get, get investment. Whereas a lot of people, you know, you can get paralysis analysis where you're just analyzing the market and be like, okay, cool, I need X, Y, and Z. It's going to need... In order for me to continue with you this. Know, and but sometimes it's not about the resources that you have, mm. but it's about how resourceful you, you are, are with, with what, what you, you have. have. You know, so 200,000 when you hear it in the first time and you're in filmmaking, you're like, what? Mm. No one can make a film with 200,000. You're joking. You're surprised. <laughs> you know, Easy. but today, like you're saying, the technology has enabled people like myself to put together YouTube channels mm. because the equipment is a fraction of the cost mm. of what it used to be. Yeah. It just takes you a willingness to sort of, you know, mm. take that action, take those few steps. Um, but in your space where you're constantly taking these steps and stepping into areas that you've never stepped into mm. before, you know, where do you draw courage? Because you know, a lot of people are afraid of failure. Mm. You know, there are a lot of girls out there who would love to enter a pageant, mm. but they're like, yo, if you fail, I'm not going to get it. You know, there are a lot of girls who would love to be DJs, but you know, are thinking, ah, this thing is for guys, whatever. So from, from, from your experience, maybe you can speak to the areas you go to to draw strength and courage to really step into these places and even when you don't have all the answers, you're just resourceful with whatever you have. Yeah. I hate those type of questions. <laughs> <laughs> go deep. Because it feels like it's something deep. <laughs> yeah. Whereas to me, it just, it almost comes naturally. Um, mm. I don't, I don't want to bank it on, oh no, you know, back in the day when I feel, no, no, no. Um, I just get inspired by anything and everything. Um, you know, if, if it's, if it's something I'm interested in, I'm just going to zoom in and go, you know, as long as it doesn't disturb my, my, my craft, my must, like my marketing is it. Mm -hmm. That is how I make my money is, is by being a marketing manager full time. So all these other elements need to balance me in a way that it adds to my core too much to, to my main uh, uh, interest mm. um and not let it disturb anything else so i just I, I i need to make sure that all of this ties up in a sense that mm, i can't seem to word it mm. but it makes sense I because to word it. if i think about it in in, in marketing terms right if you have a portfolio of products, mm -hmm. you're always going to have that one product that is your anchor product, yeah. where it's going to be the core product. Yeah. The and cash cow. <laughs> 100%. <laughs> and that's going to determine the direction of your brand portfolio yeah. category. And as long as the core is taken care of, mm -hmm. you can sort of be brave enough to experiment to with the other stuff yeah, or explore the other yeah. stuff. You know, whereas... A lot of entrepreneurs, especially in the creative space, want to first explore yeah. before and getting the core that, right. Yeah. You know, so a part of the core that is critically important is just business acumen. Mm. You know, if you're gonna be a film producer or a DJ or whatever, how good are you with money? Mm. With balancing books. Yeah. With you know investing in your marketing and getting your brand out there and using the right channels and social media etc um, because if that core is is strong and solid then you can be like ah actually there's videography here okay yeah. i can be a graphic designer as well oh, okay but this is as my as that stays in this time. is the main yeah and then and, and you keep it intact which is easier said than done yeah true <laughs> <laughs> you know because I can imagine the temptations that are mm. out there, you know, and you, I mean, you, you've traveled and you've seen, you know, places in the world that ordinary South Africans might not never ever see, mm. you know. Um, and when you see these temptations and all these glittery things that look gold, mm. 
how do you maintain the discipline yeah. not to to get deterred. distract and nah. get and, and and move off the the track? Yeah, um, like I said, um, you know, I completely live for my son. I mm. think everything is just my son. This, my son. That, my son. This, my son. This. So I'm very family orientated. Whatever I do, I make sure that it ties back to would my son be proud of this? Would mm. my son be happy with this? Would my son speak proud of his mom? Um, because of this, mm. I always tie back all of that. Um, you know, it's it's yeah, like you said, it's easy to be tempted by this, by this, by this, by this. But at the, at the end of the day, that's that one thing I always remember, which is you're doing this for someone. Mm. Um, you know, you you also don't want. I want my son to brag about me. You yeah, know what I mean, that's my mom. That's my mom. <laughs> yeah. So I don't want to lose sight of my 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 role as a provider. Um, and I mean, I think part of it is part of me not wanting to, you know, pick up a whole lot of my hobbies to make them into a complete business is because I now have to provide for him and I'm just a little scared with what if, and I'm not really destined to be, you know, a, a, a business, a, a person who owns a sound business. What if it's mm. not my thing? Yes, it works for me now. I get money here and there, weekends, mm. sound system is out. But if, what if it's not you know mm. my thing so you know that it, it ties back to that, is yeah. that i need to be accountable to somebody and make sure that he's well fed he's well clothed he's mm. he's in, in school and he's fine he's happy yeah. and know? and for me you know in, in the context of, of business you know what i hear when i hear that is is mission mm. you know to to have this why that is your grounding framework for all the decisions that you yeah. make. Because when the why is there and it's solid and it's loud enough, then you can endure anyhow. Yeah. You know, when times are tough, and times will get tough, yeah. but it's your why that wakes you up in the bed and be like, okay, for my this son. This is why I need to do this, yeah. You know, yeah. and in the spaces that, you know, we've worked in big companies, um, big companies make that apparent to say, we do sell and we do make money and yes that is the big driver but there is a bigger mission yeah. in terms of impacting the people yeah. around us you know um how important is that for someone who either wants to work in a creative industry or wants to build a business out of that to be mindful of the people around you yeah. and the impact you know that that you can have and then using that using that to to really you know build your business in a sustainable way ha ha in in your experience do you think that's important it is and if so, it's so how do people then use that it really? is important i think my my judgment and my my drive gets so overcast by the fact that uh, i'm a mom in this and this no 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 mm. Um, you know, there's inspiring the next person, um, motivating the next person. That's what I think grows you up as well, mm. fulfills you. Mm. Um, I mean, yes, every, every bit of industry that I've tapped into, I've had people come back to me and say, this was it. You know, when I met you, you told me this and this is and this. I really appreciate that, you know, and that gives self fulfillment. Um, you know, you've you've reached your purpose. Mm. Um, you might not have fully understood what you were able to do for them, but they know, mm. and God knows. Uti, I sent you to this earth to do this, mm. and you are affecting other people, and they are growing because of you and what you, been uh, what you what you afforded them that uh, that opportunity that you afforded them. And so that also gives purpose mm. to life now, just yeah. general life. And it's one of those things that we, we tend to not look after. Mm. We tend to not care for self and the next person. And I mean, looking at big corporates, we can learn a lot from big corporates because they have CSI um, initiatives or mm. co corporate social investments where they would 
you know, do something to help the next person. But I think they do it in a selfish way. Yeah. But if you're in a company that has a CSI program, you really need to search for your meaning, for, yeah. for the one that you're going to leave a lasting legacy for. Mm. Um, like the company you've worked for, Unilever, they mm. used to deal a lot with uh, empowering women. Mm. And, you know, oh, geez, I, I got so empowered at Unilever. Um, mm. Business-wise, um, I mean, it's the one company that did promote a woman in, in top positions, mm. a woman to have their own business, to make their own money, um, to have their own thoughts, ideas, and whatnot. And, and you know, you, you talk bad about uh, corporates, but they actually, treat, uh, um, they actually teach you the true values of, 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 of life and how to give back to the next person. Yeah. They've got the budget. You might not have. So mm -hmm. I would say I'm no longer in a corporate, so I, I don't have those CSI. We, we, as a municipality, we do have those outreach programs. Mm -hmm. But in a corporate environment, you're a brand manager. You know that you know, this company does this uh, during the month of October and you've got a budget of six million yeah. and, and whatnot. Make it count. Mm -hmm. Make it count. Um, you will leave Unilever in, in three years, five years, but that six million will always remain in that community mm -hmm. to say, but Sharon Gomede came. They won't even say Unilever. They'll say Sharon Gomede. So you must use these corporates. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. They've got the budget. Find your purpose and just go to town with help mm. the next person. Leave a last yeah, legacy. Yeah, that's that's powerful. And for me, I hate the word responsibility. So whenever someone says corporate social responsibility, I like I cringe yeah. because then you make it an obligation that people are forced to do because there's yeah. some kind of legal mandate. But when it's an investment, when a business says to me it's an investment, yeah. that's a business saying actually I'm seeing value in this. I'm not just doing it to make myself feel good or tick a box, yeah. but I'm seeing real returns yeah. that it can have for my business. I understand that the context of my business operates within a broader framework of other stakeholders. That if I have a positive impact on my community and the people who actually mm. buy my brand, then I stand a better chance yeah. of they generating real returns in the future. Well. Yeah. So it's also critical in entertainment, film, media, arts, not just to, you know, live, live in, in this isolated yeah. mind of yours, but to have this understanding of how it connects. Mm -hmm. And I love the fact that we are here at the Saftas. Yes. You know, we recorded this at the Saftas because I researched the three-headed trophy horn. Mm -hmm. um, and Did what, you? Yeah, and what it means. And I love the, the collaboration yes. um, to say there are other people mm -hmm. who played a part in you winning this award yes. and to celebrate that collaborative sort of effort, you know. Um, and just like I can imagine in your life, you know, there are other people that played a part and, you know, spoke life into you. Yes. Lastly, as we wrap this up, I would like you to speak life to someone out there. Maybe it's a young girl, maybe it's a young guy yeah. who's thinking about you know, marketing, thinking about arts, entertainment, media, film, um, and it's just looking for direction, words of wisdom, and encouragement. Mm. You know, if you had the opportunity, you know, what would you say? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> As a mouthful. <laughs> so, yeah, Tavo, um, I'm very passionate about a girl child, mm -hmm. um, along with several other people, of course, but I am passionate about the raising of a girl child in a sense that women need to be given more opportunities and the only way to start teaching women to be where they are is to start at high school level, mm -hmm. even, even before that if you really must, but high school level is where you start to really train a child. You know, your decorum, your manners, that's where it starts. If you can't have manners while you're in high school, you'll never have manners in a workplace. Mm -hmm. 
And so we need to start teaching our girls that at a very young age. I mean, it, uh, yeah, same for boys, but like I said, uh, my core is just women. Mm -hmm. There's nothing more unattractive than a rude woman at work. We get our given opportunities to be CEOs and managing directors and whatnot. And they trust us with their brand. And then we are unapproachable. Because sure. I'm rude. Gaziwa. Angenek. We don't need that. And it just shows that you never even had manners from your upbringing. And so we need to catch it while it's still at early stages. It's manners, it's your decorum, it's your, you know, how you treat the next person. Um, responding to somebody who has a query with you, you don't need to be combative, you don't need to fight them. Um, I've faced a lot of women in corporates where the brand, you watch the brand collapse because the MD, the female MD was just unapproachable, hard, you know, mm. almost like untaught and rude. You don't need to be, mm. you know, you need to, to speak to people, be, be fun, yeah. be, be approachable, you know, you don't need to be that person. Yeah. You don't need to be that girl. You are going to destroy companies with your attitude alone. Mm. And so that's what I'm about. You know, teach a girl child to love life, to, to, to love the next person. Um, use social media very, very, very responsibly. Mm. I mean, you've got young girls committing suicide because somebody said something on social media. Mm. You know, um, my big thing as well is, you know, you don't want to be that girl who used social media in such a bad way that it catches up with you mm. in your in your in your MD years now, you the MD and whatnot, but now some guy out of nowhere has a nude picture of you. Sure. You don't wanna be that girl. Why you gave him a nude when you instead of nine? Mm. Don't. Mm. You know. So we need to teach our, our children to just have goals, have values and whatever you do now will have a rippling effect mm. if, if you know if you're going to invest good you'll get greatness if you're going to invest rot mm. you just that's it alela, you know mm. so and until we teach our children to just grow up in a sense that it's almost like just teach them that one day you're going to be great but you can't be great if you're going to be you know sending news mm. if you're going to be rude if you're going to you know, socially bull, uh, bully somebody and then... No, that makes a lot that's, of sense. That's me. No, and that's that's powerful, that's refreshing, yeah. it's enlightening. So, Sharon, <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much for agreeing to do this. Um, it's, it's been a pleasure. It's been insightful, a lot of wisdom, a lot of knowledge. Um, you're a person that lives and breathes every word that you speak. You know, so I've seen it. I've been privileged enough to witness you and your greatness. So for me, it's just inspiring. And guys, promise you, if you really take to heart what Sharon has shared today, it is transformative in an unbelievable way. So please make sure that you go back to some of the stuff that she said. You watch it again. You write the notes because whether you're in the business of arts or not, or entertainment or media or not, it's just universal knowledge that is applicable in all aspects of life. So I've truly been impacted so much. If you're offline, make sure that you switch on. And like I keep trying to tell you, I keep trying to tell you, promise you, it's going to be a movie. One love.